and welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Eun Jung Cho. The group of 20 talks in Japan provided a venue for regional leaders to gather and discuss important global issues, including the North Korean denuclearization. The G20 is followed by President Trump's visit to South Korea. Are there now boosted hopes for a resumption of denuclearization talks? I'm heading to Japan, Osaka, and we're going to be meeting with a lot of different countries. In the studio with me today, Dr. Patrick Cronin, Asia-Pacific Security Chair at the Hudson Institute. Dr. Cronin spent more than three decades in the U.S. government and think tanks specializing in Asia-Pacific security. Also joining me, Mr. Scott Snyder, Director of U.S.-Korea Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Snyder has authored numerous books on Korean politics and foreign policy and Asian regionalism. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Snyder, let me begin with you. On the sidelines of the G20 summit, uh, President Xi told President Moon that Chairman Kim Jong-un is still committed to denuclearization that he wants to resolve through dialogue and will remain patient. So by mentioning the word patient, do you think North Korea is not in a hurry right now? So what I think is really interesting is that uh, through Xi Jinping, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un is sending a message of patience that actually mirrors the message of patience that is coming from President Trump. But at the lower levels, I think that we see a little bit more uh, anxiety. The North Koreans have their deadline. Uh, and I think the deadline represents a desire to get something going uh, in terms of a window of opportunity for dialogue. And Special Representative Began has been very forward-leaning. Uh, Secretary Pompeo has been even more forward-leaning, talking about getting to talks at a moment's notice uh, with North Korea. Well, Kim is a lot more patient in 2019 than he was in 2018. I think if he sees a good deal on the table, real concessions from his perspective, I think he'll grab it quickly. But he is trying to signal that he's not in such a hurry. And yet, Kim has also said the end of the year is the deadline for negotiations and making progress. So he wants it both ways. He's using time as a variable in negotiation for his benefit. Mm -hmm. So um, North Korea is putting the blames on the United States for the current stalemate. Um, North Korea's foreign ministry not only giving the timeline, the deadline for coming up with the new proposal from the United States, it also said the United States should change the interlocutors to somebody who can communicate better with North Korea. So I see a hardening of position here. Do you see a, a room for negotiations? Well, there's room for serious negotiation if North Korea wants to be serious. Um, and if they don't want to be serious, then there's very little room because there's, the conflicting positions will continue indefinitely. I think, of course, North Korea is going to blame others for um, trying to move toward their view. Um, they're looking for leverage. They're looking for concessions and compromise that benefits them. I don't think Kim has made the fundamental decision to give up nuclear weapons. And as a result, he's saying, what can I get in the meantime? Can I get sanctions relief? So there's room for serious negotiations. I think we may see some renewed negotiations here in July. But I don't know that he's made any real concession yet that deserves them. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Snyder, um, Special Representative Began in recent weeks um, repeatedly mentions a simultaneous and parallel approach to North Korea. Does, is this a sign that U.S. is moving more towards a simultaneous and phased approach that North Korea has been asking for? No, I really see it as trying to reframe the approach that the U.S. has been taking uh, in the context of the Singapore Declaration uh, as a multi-track approach. Uh, and that was followed in Hanoi where you had normalization of relations, peace, uh, denuclearization, and the POW-MIA issue. And what happened was that uh, two of those tracks uh, went forward without too much difficulty, but the third track, denuclearization, got stuck. And so I think that essentially what the administration wants to do, they, they want a comprehensive deal. They don't want a partial deal. But then when you get to implementation, inevitably, uh, it's going to come in steps. 
Uh, and so trying to figure out how to explain that is, is hard, I think, especially to the public because there's a, an, all, an all or nothing element to the idea of being comprehensive in scope uh, about the understanding of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and that, I think, has confused people who are looking for some kind of a phased approach. But what the administration is not willing to do is to accept a partial denuclearization deal as a way of starting without knowing that we're trying to get to uh, full denuclearization. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Cronin, um, during talks, uh, President Xi told President Moon that North Korea is still devoted to economic development and improving the livelihoods of its people. Is this a positive for the United States? Well, not necessarily, because it may be that Kim wants not just development or butter, but he may want guns and nuclear weapons, too. If he's made a strategic choice to give up some nuclear weapons in exchange for that economic development, then it could be a good development. We hope so. But I'm going to be skeptical on this until we get to the next stage of negotiations. That is, until we get to a substantial deal that Kim says, I really will denuclearize through a process. I'm taking a substantial first step, but I do need some economic relief. Short of that, I think we need to be very skeptical about Kim's uh, sort of s sincerity and whether she really is pushing him or whether he's just trying to keep talking rather than actually acting toward denuclearization. Mm -hmm. And since the breakdown of the Hanoi summit, um, Russia and China reached out to North Korea and China says North Korea's concerns should also be addressed. Russia says North Korean security should be guaranteed. So is China and Russia currently staunchly defending North Korean interests in the talks? Well, I think that we can also say that Russia and China have expressed support for North Korea's denuclearization. It's just not necessarily clear that they want it on terms that end up favoring the United States. Uh, and so this is a very tough line to walk because I think the, the Russians and the Chinese uh, can put up obstacles uh, to moving forward uh, if it looks like the U.S. is gaining too much from a denuclearization process. But in terms of uh, an overall, I think, rhetorical commitment to denuclearization and even to some extent to pressuring North Korea in that direction, I think that uh, the administration is benefiting from more solidarity uh, at this moment uh, than we had seen in previous years. Not as much as the administration wants, but I think that they probably perceive that they're not in a bad position. And during his summit with President Moon, President Xi brought up the issue of fat for the first time in a year. Why do you think, what is the implications? Well, the negative implication is that China is more interested in South Korea giving up its defensive missiles than forcing North Korea to give up its offensive missiles with nuclear weapons. A more generous interpretation might be that we're about to enter an agreement and the Chinese leader is signaling that as part of that agreement, we hope that you'll be reducing military moves, including the missile defense system that we in China, and by the way, Russia, object to. Mm -hmm. And during the talks, um, President Trump and Prime Minister Abe vowed to fully implement UN Security Council resolutions on North Korean missiles and nuclear um, activities and programs. So is Japan currently the country that is totally in sync with the United States when it comes to North Korea policy, more so than South Korea? They're totally in sync with that part of U.S. policy. Uh, and I, so I think that the sanctions part is the part that the U.S. and Japan have no light on. But, uh, and, and actually, even in terms of engaging uh, with North Korea, we've seen a little bit of a shift uh, by Abe uh, by moving toward unconditional um, uh, willingness to meet uh, with Kim. But I think there's no question that in Japan there's a lot more hesitancy and anxiety, frankly, about the idea of uh, the leader-to-leader -leader level dialogue between Trump and Kim. Mm -hmm. So President Trump visited South Korea at the invitation of President Moon. Why did he make this visit? Does he, did he believe that his visit would give new momentum to revive the talks? So it's very important for Moon and Trump to coordinate exactly on the next steps. And being on the Korean Peninsula, who knows? New things could happen. There could be progress. It's important, though, that when President Trump gets back to Washington, he knows exactly where President Moon and he stand vis-a-vis -vis managing North Korea. Mm -hmm. And um, President Moon came up with a fresh idea that um, dismantling, completely dismantling Yongbyon nuclear complex would reach an irreversible denuclearization step and that the international community should consider partial easing of sanctions. So is, what are the chances that the United States will take up this new idea? 
Well, you're talking about one step within a very long march toward denuclearization. And while that step may be an initial step that would be taken, it's insufficient to agree to sanctions relief, in my view, um, just for that step. Yongbyon is not, as President Moon said, the mainstay of the nuclear production material um, capability of North Korea. We believe those facilities are outside of Yongbyon. Would it be useful to close down Yongbyon? Yes, of course. Would it be worth paying some price for it? Sure, that's reasonable. But it needs to be part of a bigger package deal and, and clear steps. And that verification, by the way, is going to be very thorny trying to implement it. So let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Um, announcing Yongbyon closure, for instance, is going to take time, even if we accept that deal. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, it's a mistake for President Moon to talk about irreversibility. Uh, the U.S. has moved away from irreversibility uh, by moving from CVID uh, to fully, final fully verified denuclearization, dropping the irreversible part, in part because it's so difficult to define what is irreversible, and we've been burned by that in the past. Uh, but what I think is also going on here, which is more complex, is uh, that in South Korea, there seems to be an effort to um, project satisfaction uh, with a Yongbyon uh, only sort of agreement by saying that, well, we're getting um, at least half a loaf, uh, but I think that the U.S. still wants the whole loaf. Uh, and so that's a real problem because um, we need to be coordinated on that, on that front. Mm -hmm. And South Korea made a uh, official proposal, public proposal to North Korea to hold inter-Korean summit before President Trump visits South Korea. And North Korea's response was that it will never go through South Korea ever again to talk with the United States. Why is this? I think North Korea is showing its true colors. Uh, it used South Korea when it needed South Korea, but ultimately uh, on the denuclearization issue, uh, they want to be uh, seen as going toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, with the United States. Uh, and it's very interesting because North Korea is doing no political favors uh, to President Moon uh, by essentially cutting him out of the process. Mm -hmm. And President Trump and Chairman Kim recently exchanged letters. President Trump called it beautiful. Chairman Kim said the excellent contents. So is the exchanging of presidential letters, is this becoming a critical part of diplomacy? Well, it's not like World War II with <laughs> Churchill and FDR exchanging meaningful letters about strategy. I mean, I feel like here in the digital age, we're going back to the Victorian age of great letter writing. Um, it's unnecessary. Um, pick up a telephone and have a conversation about what do you mean by denuclearization? Here's what we mean. Um, why don't you have your negotiators meet with our negotiators and let's move forward? Um, so the letter writing seems like stalling to me. It seems like theater and a disruptive tactic, not actually moving forward. It's what you do when you're not making real progress. Hopefully there'll be real progress made and they can, again, in the future, pick up a telephone. Mm -hmm. And with the exchange of letters, there are rising expectations that there could be another third summit between the United States and North Korea. Um, and President Trump suggested there should be more progress in the working level before that materializes. So what do you think could be the trigger for North Korea to come back to the working level talks? Well, it's very hard to say, but President Trump has an opportunity to deliver a message uh, in South Korea, uh, possibly uh, at the DMZ, that uh, I'm sure that the North Koreans are going to scrutinize uh, very closely. And uh, the North Koreans have also indicated what their conditions would be uh, for uh, getting back to talks. Uh, and so I think the important thing is that both sides are signaling in one way or another uh, that there is the possibility, the resumption of engagement to pick up where they left off in Hanoi. Mm -hmm. And recently, the rise of North Korea's foreign ministry and the fall of the United Front Department in discussions with the United States, is this a positive for the United States, do you think? You know, I don't want to say that the specific parts of the bureaucracy of North Korea don't matter, but the bigger obstacle is not who is negotiating for Kim Jong-un, it's Kim Jong-un's negotiating position. That's the real obstacle right now, that he does not want to make a strategic decision to significantly give up parts of his nuclear weapons capabilities until he sees something much larger, at least, in terms of sanctions relief. So it's that position, and that's not really about what the negotiators say to Steve Began or to Mike Pompeo. It's, it's really about the position at the top. So this may be meaningful in time if we were actually engaged in a serious negotiation in trying to implement it, but I think trying to get to the starting gate of that it's not as significant. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Cronin, on a final note, are we entering a new phase in diplomacy? 
I think July will tell us whether we are. I think it's a good possibility that July will be an inflection point in this year and a half plus negotiation that's been going on, that we may be moving into that first real phase of negotiation, um, or uh, we're, it's nowhere close. And I think we'll know that in July. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll leave our conversation here and now watch video for our next discussion. Regardless of what some critics may say about the state of our bilateral relationship, we really have nothing more to prove. President Trump visited South Korea for the second time since taking office. Washington says President Trump's visit is another sign that the alliance between South Korea and the United States is as strong as ever. Now, Dr. Cronin, um, there were concerns about the U.S.-South Korea coordination last year over pacing and the gap. So has the coordination improved since? Well, I think it has improved in part because the diplomacy with North Korea has slowed down. Um, when things were moving at a frenetic pace in 2018, Fear dominated. There was a big concern that South Korea, a progressive government pushing for inter-Korean peace, might get well out ahead of the United States, which was mostly concerned about denuclearization talks. I think those things have leveled off, and I think there's a recognition, even from Kim Jong-un, that he needs to move forward with the United States before he can move further ahead with South Korea. So as a result, I think the coordination, the careful management of policymakers in both Seoul and Washington have stabilized a very strong, durable alliance. But there are always questions. And if there's big change ahead in the future of dealing with North Korea, um, these challenges may rise again very quickly. But at the moment, they seem to be managing uh, quite well. Mm -hmm. Was it effective, U.S.-South Korea working level, um, the task force? I think that it has been. I think that uh, the U.S. and South Korean governments are really coordinating very closely. Uh, last week, uh, Steve Began and Ido Hoon were here in Washington. Uh, right this week, they uh, have been coordinating uh, in Seoul. Uh, and from what I understand, at the working level, uh, really every aspect of possible engagement with North Korea is being coordinated uh, between the two sides. And so that, what that does is it lashes up the inter-Korean relationship uh, with the U.S.-North Korea relationship uh, in ways uh, that ensure that there won't be any uh, coordination hiccups between the two. Mm -hmm. And President Moon and South Korean Unification Minister recently again mentioned that Kaesong Industrial Complex should be reopened, although they did acknowledge that there should be progress first in denuclearization. So does South Korean desire to pursue economic development, economic pro projects with North Korea, would it become a um, source of division in the future? It could if it's not handled right. Uh, you know, this was one of President Moon's main campaign platforms, the idea of a, a, an inter-Korean uh, economic uh, map uh, to cooperation. Uh, and so I don't think there's anything wrong with him talking about uh, that objective, uh, but I think that there would be uh, serious problems if he proceeded in trying to pursue those projects in an uncoordinated fashion. Mm -hmm. Well, there are a range of views from the administration. In general, they'd like to see any economic development come after significant progress has been made on some denuclearization and they want to see that economic development lead to reform and openness. But the United States understands it has to be the supporting partner here for South Korea when it comes to inter-Korean relations and development. So the United States, despite its instincts to want to lead on this issue, is going to have to be somewhat restrained and try to support President Moon as he can make progress on inter-Korean development. Mm -hmm. This is where I think it's so interesting that the North Koreans have actually been helpful in terms of promoting U.S.-Korea coordination by essentially shutting off the pressure and being unwilling to engage in the inter-Korean channels. Now, um, it appears the differences over bilateral trade is resolved and burden sharing has been temporarily resolved. So what is the current state of bilateral ties between Washington and Seoul? Well, it remains a strong military alliance to deter and defend the interests of South Korea and the United States should conflict or violence be apparent or break out. 
Um, at the same time, the close people-to-people -people ties, trade ties are growing. There's been improvement because of the reformed FTA between Korea and the United States. I think the thorny issue continues to be this special measures agreement. This is supposed to be a multi-year, five-year, six-year agreement. They only managed a one-year agreement to sort of paper over the differences right now. There's no doubt that President Trump has sent signals to all allies around the world that the United States has to see more um, sort of support, more sh shouldering of burdens from allies, even strong ones like South Korea, which spends a lot on defense. Um, so this is, issue is not over, and South Korea needs to take this issue very seriously because those who care about the alliance want to, this not to be an issue on which this ruptures. I think President Trump is using this as leverage. He, he knows the importance of the alliance, but at the same time, he is campaigning on this issue. And we have a 2020 election coming up, and he will continue to campaign on the issue that allies should be shouldering more burdens. Yeah, I'm quite concerned about that issue. Uh, I think that the, the big problem with it is, is that it can distract uh, from coordination on North Korea. Uh, so far, I think that it has been handled at a level that it hasn't caused significant damage. Uh, but it's easy to imagine that if this issue becomes politicized, there could be public backlash and uh, the emergence of serious tensions mm -hmm. between Washington and Seoul over that kind of issue. Mm -hmm. So during the G20, um, President Moon and Prime Minister Abe didn't meet. And um, uh, recently, State Department's Korea Desk Director Joy Yamamoto said, Japan and South Korea's bad relationship will not help us um, succeed in nuclear negotiations with North Korea. So are the bilateral ties between Japan and South Korea so bad that it raises concern from the United States? Yes, uh, the situation is very bad. Uh, the United States wants to see uh, Japan and South Korea working with each other. I'm sure that the administration is trying to do what it can behind uh, the scenes. Uh, and actually the uh, confirmation of a new Assistant Secretary for East Asia is really very important because that is the level of government that usually bears the brunt in terms of pushing forward uh, support for a better Japan-South Korea relationship. Well, they could be doing more. I think they're reluctant to spend as much political capital as they have in the past because they have their own issues with both South Korea and Japan separately, including special measures agreement, burden sharing, trade, and other issues. But as Scott suggested, we do have a new Assistant Secretary of State David Stilwell. I know he's about to do some travel to the region. I'll be very surprised if he's not uh, talking to our Korean and Japanese allies very soon. And I suspect our diplomacy will be trying to continue to patch things up between Seoul and Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll end our conversation here and now move on to our next segment. Now time for the photo moment. Time to look at an interesting North Korea picture. Today we have a photo of North Korean children in a nursery. A UN assessment team, including the World Food Program, <laughs> met these children in April. The team warned of a hidden hunger stemming from micronutrient deficiency among North Korean children who mainly consume rice and kimchi and no protein. Scott, what's your reaction? Uh, well, that sort of assessment is, it's, it's really been uh, part of the picture in North Korea for a very long time now, two decades. Um, uh, and I think that is the one area where uh, the UN uh, programs uh, can deliver assistance uh, that cannot be diverted is by providing micronutrients uh, to uh, vulnerable uh, children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're in charge of um, U.S.'s foreign aid to other countries, right? And the main issue on this was always, could we live up to our humanitarian principles? Don't make this an issue of a quid pro quo for diplomacy on nuclear weapons, but rather if they were to open up and be transparent, so that we could verify that the assistance gets to those in need, then we should all be supporting that up to some, some level. Mm -hmm. At, there's a global competition for humanitarian need. Mm -hmm. So it has to be compared to parts of Africa and elsewhere that may need it. But we should not be holding this hostage for diplomacy on no nuclear weapons. We should be dealing with children and vulnerable people, the elderly, but only if North Korea allows us and allows international organizations and the United Nations to ensure that it gets to those in need. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Mr. Snyder, Dr. Cronin, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this was Washington Talk from the Voice of America, and I'm Eun Jung Cho. Join us next week for more analysis on North Korea.